So we go from the jungles of Central America to the urban jungles of Los Angeles in this highly debated about ultra-violent sequel to the Arnold Schwarzenegger classic with Predator 2. In the year 1997, the LAPD wages a war against both the Colombian drug cartel and a rival Jamaican gang in a scorching hot polluted Los Angeles. Lieutenant Detective Mike Harrigan leads the charge headlong, especially once an unknown wildcard begins wiping out people on all three sides, leaving only skin cadavers in its wake. When shady government official Peter Keyes arrives to take over the investigation under the guise of the DEA, Harrigan is further driven to uncover exactly what's going on. However, as he becomes more involved putting his team in the crosshairs of what turns out to be a deadly extraterrestrial predator, Harrigan becomes its primary target. With Keyes ultimately revealing his intention to track and capture the hunter for its advanced technology, the hunt intensifies as Harrigan stands alone to face down this dangerous enemy. So armed with a $35 million budget, Predator 2 was released to U.S. cinemas on November 21st, 1990 and made its way across the rest of the world over the next 12 months and actually failed to become a box office hit, garnering only $57.1 million worldwide being met with mostly negative reviews criticizing a lot of the violence of the film and the general feel and tone of the film overall and again being released in the U.S. in a very odd time period of the Thanksgiving Christmas season where it's usually dominated by a lot of family films such as Home Alone and Three Men and a Little Lady or big studio epics like Dances with Wolves at the time really seemed that this was a summer action movie that got transplanted to another season just because that became the happenstance of production and release and all that type of stuff really seemed like there was a lot of things that went wrong in terms of marketing and the presentation of the film and gauging the tastes of the audiences at the time or whatnot and definitely what people would have expected from a Predator sequel that does not include Arnold Schwarzenegger because he decided to go off and make Terminator 2 Judgment Day instead, which was obviously a big boost to his career overall after the major success of Total Recall that summer. And so the genesis of Predator 2 really came about during the production of the first Predator where Jim and John Thomas, the screenwriters of both the first and second films, did kind of come up with an idea about like what the idea of the Predator or how the Predator would look like being transplanted from this very organic, jungle or whatnot and into a much more of a concrete steel city environment. So they zeroed in on director Stephen Hopkins who had been born in Jamaica, grew up in England and Australia and just done A Nightmare in Elm Street 5 The Dream Child which despite a lot of the critical reaction still made a good amount of money and so they took this stylish director who's hot off a nice success there, transplanted him into another film which kind of interesting that they did the same thing with Rennie Harlan after he'd done The Dream Master transplanted him into Adventures of Ford Fairlane and Die Hard 2, so kind of interesting how Fox was looking at these type of up-and-coming directors with a, with a very stylish look to their films and everything, so they took Stephen Hopkins, who definitely has a very comic book expressionistic sensibility to him that back in this point in time, early in his career, really had that style to him, that big kind of comic booky, over-the-top type of interesting type of way to look at how to construct and design his films and everything and a lot of that does transplant into Predator 2 because you do look at the stylistic differences between John McKiernan's film and Stephen Hopkins film and there's definitely a departure here where McKiernan's film was a very gritty type of film very grounded a lot of suspense going on in that film a lot of tension very grounded sensibility in how the film looked and how it was given a certain tone or whatnot. With Predator 2, Stephen Hopkins definitely gives the film a much more amped up type of feel. There's a lot more violence, like I said in the film, but everything feels like it's punched up and jacked up a little bit. There definitely is a definite comic book stylistic vision to the film with a lot of the much more colorful characters that it has going on a lot. A lot bigger type of things going on the whole thing with the Jamaican gangs and the Colombian gangs, all the cartels going on and all the extreme violence that's happening in the film. It definitely feels like a very adult graphic novel of sorts that could be 
put on screen here with his style of the film really kind of informs that so much of how the film is shot and how it's executed overall. The film has a very quick, tight pace to it, but does have a lack of that type of suspense and tension that you kind of would have wanted to to keep you kind of gripped into the proceedings of the film. There's a lot more levity in the film as well. There's a lot more sensibility of getting adding in a, a different sense of humor to certain things here and there with you got like Bill Paxton character and some things Gary Busey's doing that do have a little bit more sensibility of a different style of humor than he had in the first film. Even Morton Downey Jr.'s character of this tabloid, extreme, hardcore type of uh, journalist and everything as in all these more colorful, vibrant type of elements to the whole film that does make it more splashy in a certain way but does rob it of a certain quality that you kind of like from the first film if you do prefer that one instead of this one but what Stephen Hopkins does bring to the film is a very slick, polished type of way to look at action and everything like that and does bring together a nice, solid crew of people all the talented artists that you had with Stan Winston Studios and Alan Silvestri as the composer and a good cinematographer here and a very solid cast overall in this whole thing and leading off this cast as Lieutenant Detective Mike Harrigan is Danny Glover here who is not your typical choice for an action hero lead but the fact that Danny Glover is such a solid and committed and very charismatic actor as well brings forth a lot of nuance and subtle depth to the character that can really make him an engaging and relatable type of character in this whole film that he has a sense of warmth to him with the team that he has within the police department and has that kind of gung-ho action hero mentality of sorts but also has wonderful moments of humor that he can really just spark off something that can really entertain an audience to keep you engaged with this character about what he's going through and what he's dealing with and the everything that he's trying to crack open with all this Peter Keys mystique and enigma type of stuff going on over here and dealing with all this <laughs> Colombian and Jamaican cartel war that's going on and him trapped in the middle of all this madness and everything you can really just focus in on this character who can keep a level head and keep things focused in and keep doing things that he feels are the right things to be doing in the moment Denny Glover is a really solid lead and the fact that even in a little bit of a moment there you see that he's got a physique on him. He's not a slouch of an actor or whatnot. He's in a really solid top shape in this film. Definitely feels like Denny Glover is a really solid fit that works for what they wrote this character to be. So it's not like a lot of shadow type of action hero leads. But when you get Danny Glover in there you get a little extra something into the makeup of the entire character to make it a little bit more going forward in this narrative that he does drive very very well with a lot of solid sensibilities and a very intelligent persistent type of mentality overall and him getting to reteam with his lethal weapon co-star of Gary Busey is kind of a nice little extra added thing in this whole movie and this is kind of a signature Busey here as Peter Keese and kind of his top form or whatnot a little bit after he had his motorcycle accident and really was getting his career back up on its feet and whatnot this was a nice solid step for him to get into this film to really reestablish himself after that accident. And he does a wonderful job as Peter Keys, making him just a slight bit sleazy throughout the entire makeup of the character. Right from the first moment that you really meet him or whatnot, he seems just like a little too slick. He seems a little too glad handling. You can tell this guy has ulterior motive written all over him, but he has all that great Gary Busey sort of slick, subtle type of quality he's got going on with a little sense of a slight over-the-topness and whatnot, just slight exaggerations here and there in his performance that just like is nicely counterbalanced between these two actors who work wonderfully together having that pre-established sort of relationship from Lethal Weapon along with producer Joel Silver as well so you got a lot of really good cogs here that really have a great chemistry and know how to work off each other really hit these beats to work at the same levels and same wavelengths and Peter Keys is just this really good character that apparently was supposed to be Arnold Schwarzenegger returning as Dutch with a probably did a little bit of rewrites when they changed the character and the casting and everything but I like that they went a different direction here and have a character that you can kind of despise and have a interesting quality that Keys is both a, a good guy and a kind of a bad guy that you can see that this guy has much more uh, personal motives towards everything else that he's not going to kill the predator he's going to freeze him he's going to 
take them and dissect them and stuff like that, all this type of stuff. So it's like, he, he doesn't have the best interests of everyone in mind, but he's also not entirely the bad guy. So he's kind of this interesting figure that kind of weaves back and forth in the film, but he's definitely an adversary for Mike Harrigan to overcome in the film. And getting a whole bunch of other great supporting characters, like, again, Bill Paxton was really on this supercharged, charismatic level in this whole film, just hitting off the the quips and the the humor just all over the place just sharp as hell doing a great job just be making a great impact on the audience as he already just been winning so many other really good films such as aliens and near dark and stuff like that he's really kind of built up a lot of steam in his career by this point to make himself a really marketable type of star and Maria Conchito Alonso also does a really great performance here just having this sort of saucy type of charismatic quality to her as well that really just hits off a nice beat and whatnot really kind of make her engaging and make her entertaining as well and Ruben Blades, a wonderful actor who brings a lot of really sort of cool counterbalance to Mark Harrigan's sort of a little bit more passionate type of uh, bullheadedness when he's in the field and dealing with his superiors and whatnot. A guy who can kind of pull Harrigan back and kind of cool him off and give him a nice sort of calming investigative sort of counterbalance of those whole thing a nice quality performance from him and even getting guys like again Morton Downey Jr. who are just like the king of sleaze TV at this point in time pretty much playing the same type of character here as Tony Pope or whatnot but doing a really fantastic again exaggerated over the top type of thing which was pretty much exactly what you got with his television show at the time we're also getting like Kelvin Lockhart here who plays King Willie in this fantastic one scene portrayal that I absolutely, absolutely love. It's like the one performance that just makes the whole film for me. Just what he does with King Willie is this sort of theatrical presence that he gives to the character and this mystique that he has talking about the other side and all these different things but kind of mystical type of things to explain what this presence is that is ripping apart his people and everyone else in the city and whatnot. Is a great performance in the film from him and just this entire scene is just a masterful piece of work to me. Love that character, just love the performance. Love so much of what the actors of this film really bring to their roles to give a lot of charismatic value. I think a lot of the casting of the film was just right on the money for what everything was called for in the script and Stephen Hawkins does direct everyone very very well in the performances. And generally I like the story in this film because it does kind of feel like a direct sequel to the first film in terms of all the Peter Keys type of stuff because the military obviously learned all this type of stuff from a debriefing from Dutch and spent the next 10 years devising ways to track the Predator and capture it and try to learn its technology for their own benefit. So in that type of way it does build on what came before and references those events in the first film and so builds upon that integrates it in the story and finds new interesting ways to make that part of the entire makeup of the whole film along with all the extra things you get to learn about the Predator himself all the extra technology he has, the wider arsenal of weapons that he has at his disposal with a spear and the guns and all this type of stuff that he has going on it's just like a phenomenal type of way to just expand the mythology, expand the ideas and have that stuff to the benefit of this film and then you have all this wild fucking gang war type of stuff going on between the Colombians and the Jamaicans, all this type of stuff, wreaking havoc on this smog-filled, overheated city and everything. It's kind of interesting, again, like I mentioned a couple years ago in my Marked for Death review, which is a film that was released by the same studio in the same year as Predator 2, and also features an entire plot about Jamaican posses and whatnot coming in and wreaking havoc on a neighborhood and having someone needing to take them out and everything. So it seemed to be a, a definite thing that was going on at the time that the two particular films really did capture at that moment in time. And it's just a great culmination, all these different elements. I like the story in general that you have all these elements, some stuff that builds on what was established in the first film, expands concepts, gives you another little backbone of another story here for the characters of the cops and everything to really kind of wrap themselves in and integrate the Predator into. Kind of a little sad that that doesn't go on for longer, that you don't get this entire thing with the drug war and having the, the Predator as this wild card in the middle of the whole thing go on for a longer period of time in the film because I find that extremely entertaining in the film and very interesting to have characters continually deal with and everything but it kind of does go through all the type of things. He wipes out enough people on both sides of the whole thing that the conflict kind of dissolves itself in that type of way after 
King Willie gets his head chopped off and everything, but as a really good story, I think the film does present a good quality story overall. But a lot of people, again, kind of criticize the film with a lot of ultra-violence, a lot of more grisly type of feeling, and a different type of tone in general for the film. Because it, 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 it was a very violent film that it almost got at NC-17, but they had to keep trimming the film down to get up more grisly graphic violence out of the film to get an R rating. So it did push the limits. It did push itself as far as it could with as much gratuity as violence and gore and all this type of stuff possible. And it does have a bit more of a maybe a meaner feel to it in general that just the Predator himself is much more brazen than the one in the first film that he goes much more gung-ho. It's a lot less subtle about things, a lot more impatient about things. He really kind of just barges in and starts wiping people out left, right, and center and leaving cadavers all over the place, skin to the flesh and everything. So there's a lot more gore in this film that even the first one was very gory, was pretty violent, but this one definitely does up the ante with a lot more gunplay, a lot more general violence, a lot more victims overall. So it's like, it does just amp things up to, again, kind of a comic book type of level in a certain way that it does feel like it is more of an exaggerated, stylistic, polished type of film that does push things beyond a little bit of reality in a certain way. But definitely, definitely what he did with the film seemed to turn off a lot of critics, a lot of audiences that didn't really care for the, the much more intense, a little bit more over-the-top, flashy, vibrant style that the film really kind of went for. And maybe just the overall tone in general was not quite to everyone's liking. But in my opinion, the film does hit off good qualities with what it does. That if you if this was like the first film, if this this was like the first film of a franchise, you didn't have the McTiernan film before this, you wouldn't really have much of a an issue towards that. It's more of just the contrast back to the first film that makes a, a sense of quality differentiating in terms of tone and style, and whatnot, that makes it a little bit more kind of abrasive in a certain way when compared to McTiernan's film. In general, it is a very well shot film, very well edited film, staged, effects are fantastic in this film. I think the work that they did with the effects, both physical and visual effects, did a phenomenal job that they had a lot more time to develop a lot of these technologies and try to go into this to improve what they had on the first film to use more articulation with the Predator himself and doing a little bit of a, a redesign slightly about that. It, that Stan Winston's idea was that it's the same species, but it's another individual of the species, so you have to differentiate in more subtle type of ways with a slightly different color scheme, a little bit of different bone structure here and there, and they did have a lot more things to work with to make it a much more fluid type of process to work with it and have Kevin Peter Hull perform in the suit, make it more comfortable for him, so they had a lot more improvements to give this film in terms of just the practical stuff, but even the visual effects of this film are actually fantastic. I like so many of the effects in this film, especially, again, in that King Willie sequence where you get the Predator dropping down and having that whole sequence of just the feet hitting into the, the puddles of water. It's a brilliant, beautiful type of thing that I don't think they ever could have really done as well on the first film. Maybe because there were much more controlled environments in this film that he had a little bit more time to really kind of do the effects with much more subtlety, a little bit more precision in a certain way. But they did wonderful type of stuff overall. A lot of the cloaking effects, I think, are improved in some cases. Some stuff, because it's still optical and composite, still shows a little bit of age, a little bit of dated quality to it. But in general, a lot of the stuff is improved from what they did in the first film. And some of the stuff is still as good as it was in the first film. So nothing dips below the quality of standards the first film established for the franchise. It either stays on that level or jumps above that level to give you much more dynamic, interesting, complex effects. And the action of the film is nice and crisp and sharp and stylistic. It's all really well put together. Everything just feels sharp and impactful what they do with all the action sequences of the film. A lot of them don't feel like they overstay the welcome. They just hit and keep going and na nail all the little beats that they have to to keep the momentum going in the film. So much of what they do, again, with the cinematography of the film to make it all very stylish and flashy and just have very engaging visual style to the film and so much of how they edit it all together really puts together a tight package in most of the cases. But I do feel like the climax kind of has a little bit of a sagging quality to it in there at a certain point that 
after they kind of get into the whole thing of the slaughterhouse sequence, which once you get through that sequence and all that type of really cool stuff that goes on in that sequence, all the stylish looks of the, the entire environment and everything, all the big explosions, all the gore that goes down in it, things kind of sag out in that climax there as the chase across the roof and then across into the apartment complex, all the type of stuff. It kind of slows down, it kind of kills the momentum for a few minutes there, and I think that's kind of the only part where things aren't as tight as they could be. Still well executed, but also kind of just kills the momentum until you get in that really good sequence where they have Harrigan finds the spaceship and he goes in there and they have that final confrontation between the two of them, between Harrigan and the Predator and everything. It's a wonderful sequence and a wonderful piece of production design for the entire alien craft there. Did a fantastic job with that, just designing it and lighting it and having the choreography going on with all these nice wide angles. It's a really good sequence and just have all this type of stuff build up and just nail it and then have all those other predators show up and have that moment of kind of respect for Harrigan there that he killed one of their own and so it's like they don't go off and retaliate or whatnot. It's very much a thing that they show respect to another who had bested them so it's like it shows another piece of quality towards these characters, this species or whatnot to lay that in there to make it much more interesting and even that final thing with the, the flintlock gun or whatnot seeing that they've been coming around for a long, 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 long time just expands further on the entire mythology, the, the depth of what you can do with the ideas of the predators and everything, all these different things, just makes your mind run wild and everything, especially with that <laughs> alien skull in the trophy case that went off and just had everyone going buzzing for years and years and years. When we were going to get an alien versus predator film, then when you kind of got it, you really wish you didn't get it at all or anything, anything like that, but... There's a lot of good stuff with the action in this film and all these different things that Stephen Hopkins, like I said, does create a nice quality film here that has good cinematography, good artistic and technical qualities, a solid cast, a really good story that I think is engaging and interesting, expands ideas and all these different things. But a lot of the film just feels like it doesn't mesh with the first film in general, with the tone of it all. That I can see that definitely audiences of the time some audiences still today don't really care for that approach to the film, the the vibe the film gives off in general that it is, again, much more violent. It's much more in your face with this type of stuff and doesn't really delve into the suspense, the atmosphere the first film had. So it's a lot more just gung-ho action time and time again, charging forward. And it's kind of kind of weird, kind of weird with the, the Predator and everything that it's like Los Angeles is a very brawling spread out type of city but he always seems to be in the exact points of the city where all the main characters actually are and it's like he goes from like the cemetery one scene then he's in the subway in the next scene so it's like it all seems a little bit contrived a little bit convenient that he's always in the exact same exact right spot where all the main characters are from one beat to the next in the entire film but he also got Alan Silvestri's score in this film who's returning from doing the score in the first film and it doesn't feel all that much different from what he did with the first film. There's not a lot of expansion on the themes or the cues or doing a lot of new stuff with it or whatnot for the different environment it's set in or the different style of action or whatnot. It feels like very copy and paste from the first film onto this film. Pretty much kind of like transplanted over the uh, veneer of Predator 2 without really kind of taking into account what the style is of the film and doing something that melds it more towards what Stephen Hopkins was doing for it or wherever the case, it didn't feel like he added in anything like little kind of Latin drums for the Colombians or maybe a Jamaican beat or something like that. Maybe it was a little bit of a, a different drum here and there, but it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of like new flavor to get with his score. And it's very dis disappointing because he is a great composer, did a lot of great work over his career, still is doing that. But at this time, he was really kind of doing a lot of that stuff that sounded very, very familiar, like score for Ricochet they did for Russell Mulcahy. He sounds very Predator-esque. Stuff from Back to the Future has a similar sound, but it is at least distinguishable quite a lot from the Predator stuff with a similarity in style of musicianship and instrumentation. But generally, the Predator 2 score doesn't really go much anywhere new that you'd really want it to go to have it much of a, a new experience with it to transplant onto this new sequel and everything. 
And generally, the, the thing with Predator 2, again, it just, you got that tone that is very much different. And it's also a film that, when you, again, when you look back at the 1987 film, it feels like a film that just continues to be timeless in a certain way. It's just like, it's as good as it was then as it is now. And it's just like, it's a film that just continues to endure because the quality of everything that's put into it from a direction standpoint alone holds up over time. But Predator 2, it feels very much a film of its time, a very 1990s style film with everything that's going on, the visual style of it, the violence that it has going on, the overall tone that it employs. It just feels very much that it couldn't be made like today or whatnot. It would just feel very much like a film out of time if you made it today. The original Predator still feels like a film that could be made in different time periods and still feel like it is a contemporary type of action film in a certain way. It still has great qualities overall as a filmmaking exercise whatnot. Predator 2 just feels very much of its time and doesn't feel timeless. It doesn't feel like it goes that way. But I, I do have a friend that feels like this is the best film of the franchise. Not a lot of people seem to agree with him on that. But from the standpoint of how it expands the mythology and how all the things that are introduced in this film can continue on throughout the franchise, all the ornaments of the Predator continue on. Some of the other ideas continue forward. And it's like, it does plant those seeds. Even if some filmmakers have kind of tried to sidestep away from Predator 2 a little bit in their progression of the franchise, it still established a lot of good groundwork. So it's like, it's a really good sequel conceptually, but I think the execution just doesn't stand the test of time. It's just one of those things that a sequel can kind of miss the mark in a certain way, especially when you do have a different director with a different style and sensibilities you might not get the thing that satiates the taste of the audiences of the time. I think Predator 2 is an okay film. I don't think at all it measures up to the classic status of the first film. And we'll see how I feel about Predators as we go along into the summer, as I will review that as well. But uh, we'll see how that measures up in my uh, estimations of sequels and the franchise in general there. But uh, Again, we've got Shane Black's The Predator coming out in September. Hopefully it sticks to that this time. It's moved to release dates a couple of times, but uh, should be seeing a sneak preview of that sometime soon with a trailer coming up this spring. So, guys, I implore you to discuss your thoughts about Predator 2, what you feel about it, whether just in a vacuum of itself compared to the rest of the franchise. Generally, how do you feel it holds up in the grand scheme of action films and such, and definitely how you feel about the casting in the film in general. Do you think Glenn Glover was a very solid lead for this? He was the right pick or not? Just let me know how the myriad of ideas for this film stack up over time. So guys, thanks for watching so very much. Thanks and take care. Bye bye.